نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي واجعل لي وزيرا من اهلي اللهم فكهنا في الدين رب زدني علما اللهم اني اسالك علما نافعا رزقا طيبا وعملا متقبلا اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه اللهم ارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين ثم امين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته سوره الانعام The surah was revealed in Mecca. It has 20 stanzas and 165 verses. It is the sixth by the order of arrangement and the 55th by the order of revelation. And from here, we will be starting the second group of the surahs of Quran. And there are two Makki surahs, Surah An'am and Surah Al-Araf, and then two Madani surahs, that is Surah Al-Anfal and Surah At-Tawbah. So we are starting with the first Makki surah of the second group of the surahs of Quran. As far as the name of the surah is concerned, it takes its name, uh, its name from the verses 136, 138, and 139, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has refuted some superstitious beliefs of the people of Arabs concerning the lawfulness of some cattle and the unlawfulness of some cattle. And these superstitious beliefs, they have been refuted here in these verses. Regarding the period of revolution, according to a tradition of Ibn Abbas, the whole of the surah was revealed as a single sitting in Mecca. Similarly, there has been a tradition reported by Hazrat Asma bin Tayyazid. She was the first cousin of Hazrat Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu. That uh, she says that during the revolution of the surah, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was riding a she camel and I was holding the nose string. And when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in a condition of revolution and he was receiving the revolution, she says that I saw that the she camel, it began to feel the weight of the body so heavily that it seemed to sway on from one side to the other. And the legs of the she camel, they started shivering and trembling as if the bones would break down under the pressure. So what do we learn from here is how burdensome and how, how heavy the whole process of revolution for Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to be. But despite the fact there's so many incidents in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where we realize like when there was the, the revolution was temporarily suspended for a period of some time, he used to be extremely upset and anxious and he used to be grieved. So this shows all shows what? How how hectic this process of revelation for Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was. And despite the fact he used to be upset when it used to be suspended. So this shows the love of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for Allah, the love for Allah and the love for the Quran and the desire to learn the messages, the orders, the commandments of Allah so that he can obey and he can please Allah. And also above that, the desire to learn about the right path, the path to Jannah for himself and as well as for all the bondsmen of Allah to guide the people towards Jannah. So these are the desires of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we also learn from other traditions as well, as the Taisha radiallahu ta'ala and how she reports that in intense winter uh, season, when Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to receive the revolution, he used to start sweating during the cold weather also. And so we realize how, how much he was attached to the verses of Quran and uh, how much he had struggled and strived to receive all this Quran and the revelations of Quran from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and we learn that the whole verses of Surah Anam, they were revealed as a single sitting. And on the same night, Prophet Sallallahu recited it to the companions. And then he also made them write all those companions who used to write it down. The verses of the 165 verses of Surah Anam, they were written on the same very night when it was revealed. And the subject matter clearly shows that the surah uh, must have been revealed during the last phase of Prophet Sallallahu life in Mecca, because we have to determine the period of its revolution. It will become easier to us, easier for us to visualize the background in which the verses were revealed. So we can realize that almost like 12 years have passed since Prophet Sallallahu has been inviting the people towards Islam. And there is a total uh, rejection and refusal accompanied with persecution by the Quraysh. And the persecution and torturing by the Quraysh has reached its peak limit. And most of the many of the Muslims, they had to leave their homes and they had to emigrate to Abyssinia also. And uh, above all, by this time, the two great supporters of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hazrat Abu Talib and Hazrat Khadija, عنها, they were no more. And so all the help and the strength he was receiving from them, he was, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, also deprived of that. And uh, he was thus like deprived of all worldly supports. But in spite of this, he carried on his mission uh, with uh, facing all forms of oppositions and persecutions. And a result of this, on, on one hand, there were good people of Makkah and there were the surrounding clans which were gradually beginning uh, to accept Islam. And on the other hand was a community as a whole, which was just bent upon rejection. Therefore, if anyone um, showed any inclination towards Islam, he was subjected to taunting and physical violence and even social boycott. So in this background, the verses of <clears throat> the Surah, that is the verses of Surah Al-Anam, they basically explain about the concepts of faith. And the Surah mainly discusses the different aspects of the major articles of Islamic faith and belief, the first being Tawheed, life after death, prophethood, and their practical applications into human life. And side by side with this, it also, the surah also refutes the wrong beliefs and the up of the opponents and answers the objections. Also warns them and comforts Prophet Wasallam and the followers who were suffering from all forms of persecution. So the basic verses uh, are related. The basic and the primary message of the surah is regarding the invitation towards monotheism, that is belief in oneness of Allah, and refuting and negating all forms of polytheistic beliefs and shirk, because uh, refuting this is obviously important for, uh, for the implementation of the articles of Tawheed. And in few of the verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given like a graphic scene of the life hereafter in order to warn the disbelievers of the consequence of rejection of their articles of faith. And then there is an, a very extensive explanation and narration of the article of faith or belief of prophethood of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this also happens to be a main theme of the surah. And um, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained his mission, the limitations of his power, the attitude towards his followers, and also a point of view of the disbelievers. And in continuation of the same theme, the story of Prophet Ibrahim salam, and the mission of um, uh, Hazrat Musa salam, has also been touched to some extent. And as another proof of the prophethood of Prophet Wasallam, has been presented the belief on the book also, which has been sent down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And the divine restrictions, they have been contrasted with the superstitious restrictions of the Arabs, showing how, uh, what a striking difference between the two. And thus to prove that Quran is a divine scripture revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Jews have been criticized and the wrong beliefs of the Jews, of the Christians, and of the Arabs. They have been very strictly and strongly condemned. And in the conclusion, Prophet Sallallahu has been instructed in a beautiful and a forceful manner to proclaim fearlessly the articles of Islamic faith 
and their implications. So this is the basic summary we will be going across when we come through the verses of the surah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Hillazi, Holaka, Sama, Wati, Wal, Arda, Wajala, Zulu, Mati, one Nur, Summa, Lazina, Kafaru, Birobihim, Yatilun. All praise is due to Allah. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the starting verse is starting with the phrase Alhamdulillah. Five surahs in Quran start with the words of Alhamdulillah. These are highly valuable words and they remind and they train all of us for what? For remembrance of Allah, for gratitude of the sustainer, for patience, for the sake of obedience of the master. And last but not the least, humbleness in front of Allah Almighty. Allahumma ja'alni sabura wa ja'alni shakura. Rabbi aini ala zikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah. But despite all this, what happens is that Allah says that he is the deity who created the heaven and the earth and made the darkness and the light, then who disbelieve, equate others with the Lord. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts with the praise of Allah, with glorification of Allah, the word starts with it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces the spectacular creations of Ahsan al-Khaliqeen. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that despite all this, all these spectacular creations of Allah, people, they have, they dare to indulge in polytheism and find partners with Allah. It is he, it is he who created you from clay and then decreed a term and a specified term known to him. Then still you are in dispute and he is Allah, the only deity in heavens. <clears throat> The only deity in the heavens and earth, he knows your secrets and what you make public. He knows that what you earn. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is telling us that he knows our public and secret means what? We need to work to improve our inside and outside. So, and we need to improve in our secret and public, both manners and behaviors. And no sign comes to them from the signs of their Lord, except that they turn away therefrom. For they had denied the truth when it came to them, but there is going to reach them the news of what they used to ridicule. Have they not seen how many generations we destroyed before them, which we had established upon the earth, as we have not established you, and we sent rain from the sky upon them in showers and made rivers flow beneath them. Then we destroyed them for their sins and brought forth after them a generation of others. Why did they, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroy all of them? Because they found partners with Allah. And even if we had sent down to you a written scripture on a page and they touched it with their hands, the disbelievers would say, this is not but obvious magic. And they say, why was there not sent down to him an angel? But if we had sent down an angel, the matter would have been decided. Then they would not be reprieved. Angels come down on people only when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a punishment or a torment for them or otherwise at the time of death. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions and answers the criticism by the opponents that they used to say that why when Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been blessed with prophethood, why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send an accompanying angel who could force or who could warn or who could motivate people towards the invitations of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. And it would be an assistance for Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is answering their criticism and their mocking by telling them that if an angel had come, it would either have been a time of a torment from Allah or would have been a time of their death. And so the coming of the prophet accompanied by an angel would not, would not have been a source of belief and faith for all of them. 
And if he had made him an angel, that is, if the prophet himself would have been an angel, we would have made him appear as a man and we would have covered them. We would have covered them with what in which they were, they covered themselves and already were messengers ridiculed before you. But those who marked them were enveloped by what, by which they used to ridicule say travel to the land then observe how was the end of the deniers verse number 12 say to whom belongs whatever is in the heavens and the earth say to allah he has decreed upon himself mercy he will surely assemble you for the day of resurrection about which there is no doubt those who will lose themselves that day will are those who do not believe. And to him belongs that which reposes by night and by day, and he is the hearing and the knowing. Verse 14, say, is it other than Allah that I should take as a protector, the creator of the heavens and the earth, why it is he who feeds and it is, is not fed. Say, indeed, I have been commanded to be the first among you who submits to Allah and was commanded, do not ever be of the polytheists. So you can realize that continuously throughout these, even the starting verses of Surah Anam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is repeatedly inviting towards uh, believing in the oneness of Allah and Tawheed and is continuously these verses are refuting all forms of polytheism. Say, indeed, I fear if I should disobey my Lord, the punishment of a tremendous day. He from whom it is averted that day, Allah has granted him mercy, and there, and that is the clear attainment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us all with this clear attainment. <coughs> In the verse number 14, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from all these verses is giving a remarkable introduction of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And then Allah tells us that we have all been ordered to be the first who are obedient to him. We have been ordered to be the pointiest to surrender and to submit to him and to refrain in indulging in any forms of polytheism. So the basic topic of Surah An'am is negation of polytheism and affirmation of oneness of Allah. In these verses number 16 to 18 also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining the powers and the, and the authorities of Allah. He is from whom is averted that day Allah has granted him mercy and that is a clear attainment. If Allah should touch you with adversity, there is no remover of it except him. And if he touches you with good, then he is over all things competent. And he is the subjugator over his servants. And he is the wise, the acquainted with all. Say, what thing is greatest in testimony? Say, Allah is witness between me and you. And this Quran was revealed to me that I may warn you thereby and whomever it reaches. Do you truly testify that with Allah there are other deities? Say, I will not testify with you. Say, indeed, he is but one God. And indeed, I am free of what you associate with him. <coughs> Those to whom we have given the scripture recognize it as they recognize their own sons. Those who will lose themselves in hereafter, they do not believe. And who is more unjust than the one who invents about Allah a lie or denies his verses? Indeed, the wrongdoers will not succeed. And mention the day we will gather them all together. Then we will say to those who associated others with Allah, where are your partners? Where are your partners that you used to claim with him? Verse number 23, then there will be no excuse upon examination, except they will say, by Allah, our Lord, we were not those who associated. 
So on the day of judgment, when people will see all the truth and they will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his oneness on his throne and he will and people will realize that the only master the controller the sovereign is almighty Allah then all those who were stubborn and they insisted on any form of polytheistic beliefs they will they will just refuse indulging in uh, in all forms of polytheisms in their life. So, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all these verses has continuously negated all forms of polytheism. So we need to stop here and see and understand what we mean by tawheed and what are its implications and what do we understand by polytheism and what are its implications and how are they how are they how are we supposed to believe in the oneness of allah and stay from all forms of polytheism indeed there is absolutely no doubt that Allah does not forgive what association with him, but he forgives what is less than that for whom he wills. And he who associates others with Allah has certainly fabricated a tremendous sin. In verse 48 of Surah An-Nisa, Allah is talking about and mentioning a major sin which he will not forgive that is an unpardonable sin is being mentioned and then moreover Allah has also talked about it as it being a, a huge fabrication with Allah and then Allah has also labeled it as ithman azima a tremendous a major sin so three things now i repeat a sin which will not be forgiven an unpardonable sin something which is fabricating over allah and then a tremendous or a major sin what is this is to associate or find partners with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Polytheism is what Allah is talking about in this verse. We all know that on the day of the judgment, for a person's salvation, two basic things would be needed. Number one, right faith or belief. And the second, be righteous conduct or righteous deeds. So now the right faith or the belief, we know it comprises of five parts or five sections of faith or five pillars of faith. And by some scholars, they are also considered as six. These five are Iman Billah, meaning faith or belief in Allah. Then the second being belief in the day of judgment that is iman bil akhirah iman in the day of judgment or the day of resurrection then iman bil malaika faith or belief on the angels and their beings iman bil qutub belief or faith on the holy scriptures or the holy books which were revealed to the messengers of allah iman bil rusul that is belief or faith in the prophets or the messengers of Allah. And the sixth by some scholars is considered as faith or belief in destiny or fate. That is it being good or bad. So these are the five things for which a Muslim has to have faith or believe in when he enters Islam or when he embraces Islam. Prophet said that faith has more than 70 branches. The best among these is to declare that there is no one worthy of worship but Allah. 
and we have to be very clear about the fact that any distortion in this faith in this faith or belief of allah will not avail even if one's good deeds extend to the vastness of the heavens and the earth as allah says in surah al-imran verse 91 allah says inna allazina kafaru wa matu wa hum kuffarun falan yuqbalu falan yuqbala min ahadihim millu al-arzi zahaban la biftada bihi ulaika lahum adhabun alim wa ma lahum min nasirin as to those who reject faith and they die rejecting never would be accepted from any such as much gold as the earth contains though they should offer it for ransom for such is a grievous punishment and they will find no helpers so what is this allah is mentioning the punishment for those who reject faith or reject belief and the first and the most important belief is belief in allah and as far as the belief in allah is concerned the primary and the foremost belief in allah is the belief in oneness of allah monotheism or tawhid this is the first pillar of islam this is the basic foundation of islam hazrat abdullah bin umar radhiyallahu ta'ala and who reports in bukhari that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said buni al islam ala khamsin shahadatan an la ilaha illa allah wa anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasulullah wa iqami salata wa itai zakata wal hajji wa sawmi ramadan the foundation or the pillars of islam are on five things number 1 witnessing declaring announcing shahada that there is no god but allah and that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the servant is the slave and the messenger of allah offering salah and paying zakat and performing hajj and fasting in the month of ramadan so these are the four pillars of islam and the first and the basic and the foremost pillar of islam is to witness the oneness of allah so this monotheism this tawhid this belief in oneness of allah is what without which islam faith or belief will not be perfected or completed as allah says this will lead to all all good deeds being wasted surah al anam verse number 88 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says walau ashraku walau ashraku la habita anhum ma kanu ya'malun if they are to join partners with allah all that they did that is all the good deeds they did would be in vain for them everything will go down the drain everything will be wasted and there will be no rewards of the good deeds however great they may be if the person has done what la ashraku joining partners with allah and committing polytheism will waste all the good deeds Similarly Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala says that is why Allah orders Allah orders so frequently in Quran wa'budullah wa la tushriku bihi shay'a worship Allah and find no partners with Allah Surah Az-Zumar verse number 65 Allah orders fala tad'u ma'a Allah ilahan akhara fataquna min al-mu'adhibin do not call any other partners with allah or you will be amongst those who will be punished you will be among those who will be punished this is surah shura verse number 213 and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares in surah maida verse number 72 innahu man yushrik billahi faqad harrama allah alayhi aljanna wa ma'wahun nar 
There is absolutely no doubt. May yushrik billah. Whoever finds partners with Allah, whoever commits polytheism, faqad haram Allahu alayhi al-jannah. There it is sure shot, it is definite that Allah will forbid with him the gardens of paradise. Wa ma'wahun nar. And fire will be his abode. And this is exactly what we are reading today. The verse number 48. Let's repeat it again. In Allah la yaghfiru. Allah will not forgive and yushrik bihi that anybody finds partners with him. Wa yaghfiru maduna dhalika li man yashaw. Verse number 116 in Surah Nisa Allah repeats the same thing that Allah will not forgive joining or finding partners with him, but he will forgive whom he pleases other sins than this. So that is why Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam condemned polytheism and ordered to stay steadfast on monotheism. The words of the hadith are La tushrik billahi shayya. Don't join partners with Allah. La tushrik billahi shayya. Wa in qutilta aw harrikta. Do not find partners with Allah even though you may be slain or you may be put in fire. So this is the importance of understanding the concept of monotheism and negating all forms of polytheism. A person who believes and has faith, committed faith on the oneness of Allah will be released from hellfire and he will be made to enter the paradise and will also receive the benefits of the intercession of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's so many ahadiths to explain all this concept. Hazrat Anas radiallahu ta'ala and who narrates in Musnad Ahmad that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever dies, mamata, whoever dies in a condition that he testifies with heartfelt conviction that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger of Allah, he will enter paradise. So this is a promise of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Similarly, Hazrat Anas radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Muslim that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was riding and Hazrat Mu'az bin Jabal was riding behind him and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called him, O Mu'az, and he replied, La Baik Rasulullah wa sa'adaika. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm obedient and I'm, I'm here. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam again called him, O Mu'az, and he repeated with the same words. When he was again called Omaaz and he again repeated with the same words. And then, getting his attention, Prophet said, The person who affirms that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad وسلم, is the servant and the messenger of Allah, Allah will forbid hell for him. And another Another hadith narrated by Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala and who in Muslim Prophet says, whoever dies in a condition that he considered certain that there is no one worthy of worship but Allah will enter paradise. So this is the promise for monotheism. Hazrat Anas radiallahu ta'ala and who narrates in Tirmizi how Prophet sallallahu has promised the bondsmen of Allah Forgiveness of all sins if they stick to the faith of oneness of Allah. Prophet said, Allah Almighty declares, O son of Adam, while you keep on calling me and you have hope in my forgiveness, I shall forgive every sin you have committed. O son of Adam, if you come to me with your sins that are about the size of the earth, and meet me in a state that you have never made anyone as my partner, I shall forgive all these sins that are even about the size of the earth. Allahumma ja'alli min al-tawwabina wa ja'alli min al-mutatwaqireen. Rabbana, innana amanna, faghfir lana zanubana, faqina azaban nar. 
Hazrat Abu Huraira radiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports in Bukhari that Prophet sallallahu said on the day of judgment, the people who affirm, the people who affirm with heartfelt conviction that there was no one worthy of worship but Allah will receive the benefits of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's intercession. So this is the importance of the faith in the oneness of Allah. Now, talking about this monotheism, Tawheed, the faith or belief in oneness of Allah, I would want to make it clear that it has three aspects. The three aspects, aspects being oneness in the being of Allah, oneness in the worships of Allah, and third is oneness in the attributes of Allah. Now, I'll be talking about all three of these, one after the other. The first is oneness in the being of Allah. This is what Allah clearly announces in Surah Al-Ikhlas. The four verses of Surah Al-Ikhlas, Allah says, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدُ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَقُلْ لَهُ قُفُوًا أَحَدُ Say, He is Allah, one and only one. Allah, the eternal absolute, he begets not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like unto him. This is actually the belief in oneness of being of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qulhu Allahu ahad is actually the oneness in being. What does it actually mean? That there, there has to be no partners to Allah. The basic concept of this monotheism in being is that the person would believe that Allah has no partners, no wives, no helpers. He doesn't have a spouse, a wife, no offsprings, sons or daughters. So when somebody starts associating the creations of Allah or the creator with him, like worshipping the moon, the sun and the stars, like the people during the prophethood of Asad Ibrahim salam, they had a huge Nanar god, the god of the moon. They had a huge Shamas god, the god of the sun, the sun god. And they used to worship the stars. Then people worshipping idols made of wood or idols made of Idols made of stone, like the people of Mecca, they had they had 360 idols placed in Hanakaba. So this was what? Then worshipping trees, worshipping fire, the fire worshippers like the people in Persia. So this is all associating the creations of Allah with his with the Creator. And then the belief of certain followers of the prophets, like the Jews are the Christians that their prophets were the sons of Allah or they were a part of Allah. As Allah mentions in Surah Tawbah, verse number 30, وَقَالَتِ الْيَخُودُ وَزَيْرِ بْنُ اللَّهِ وَقَالَتِ النَّسَارُ وَقَالَتِ النَّسَارُ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ اللَّهِ ذَلِكَ قَوْلُهُمْ بِأَفْوَاحِهِمْ The Jews say that Uzair is a son of Allah. And the Christians say that Christ is the son of Allah. This is a saying which just they are saying. And they they imitate what the unbelievers of the old period used to do. And Allah curse, Allah's curse be on them. How they are deluded away from the truth. So the concept of the Christian community in saying Isa ibn Allah, that Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, na'uzu billah summa na'uzu billah min zalik, was the son of Allah or the concept of Trinity, concept of three gods. And the Jews saying Uzair ibn Allah, that Hazrat Uzair radiallahu ta'ala and who was the son of God. Or like the Makkans, they used to believe that the angels are the daughters of Allah. As Allah says in the verse 100 of Surah Al-Anam, 
Allah says, وَجَعَلُوا لِلَّهِ شُرَقَاءَ الْجِنِّ وَخَلَكَهُمْ وَخَرَكُوا لَهُ بَنِينَ وَبَنَاتٍ بِغَيْرِ إِلْمٍ سُحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَىٰ عَمَّا يَتِفُونَ They make the jinns equal with Allah. And though Allah has created the jinns, and they falsely have no knowledge, attribute to him sons and daughters, praise and glory be to him, for he is above what they attribute to him. Then making humans or making the creations of Allah as a part of Allah. Allah says in Surah Az-Zuhr of verse number 15, وَجَعَلُوا لَهُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ جُزْءٌ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَقَفُورٌ مُّبِينٌ They attribute to some of his servants as a share with him. Truly is man clearly unthankful. So I repeat now, if I sum up what is the faith in oneness of Allah is to think Never, never, ever to associate the creations with Allah. Creations being associated with Allah will be polytheism. And then thinking that the angels are the daughters of Allah will be polytheism. And then thinking that the prophets are the sons of Allah or a part of Allah will be polytheism in, the, in being with Allah. <coughs> the second the second aspect of oneness of Allah is oneness in worships of Allah. How can we understand this? That when a person embraces Islam and says, La ilaha illallah, then this is actually a pledge of the bondsman. This is actually the covenant to stick on the faith of oneness of Allah. Then when we, when we say, while narrating Surah Al-Fatiha in our Salah or otherwise, when we say, This is also a pledge which announces that we will worship no one other than Allah. Allah makes us announce and highlight this concept as Allah says in Surah An'am, verse number 162 and 163, قُلْ إِنَّ الصَّلَاةِ وَنُسْكِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَبِذَلِكَ أُمِرْتُ وَأَنَا أَوَّلُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ قُلْ سَيْ أَنَاوْنْسْ تَلْ That all my salah, my sacrifice, my life and death is for the sustainer of the worlds. He has no partners. I am commanded to be the first to submit to his orders. So this is the worship, oneness in worship of Allah. And this is exactly what we have been taught to say when we say in we sit in the tashahud of our salah and we say, Attahiyatu lillahi wassalawatu wattwayibat. All my all my verbal, my physical, or my monetary, all my oral, my bodily, or my fiscal worships are for Allah. So now, the concept of Iya Kana Budu is basically in two forms. It actually relates to two forms and states of mind. Number one, that by saying this and by believing and having faith, in the oneness of Allah as worship, we mean what? That we will worship Allah and only Allah, number one. Number two, we will worship only for Allah. We will worship, number one, we will worship only Allah and only Allah. And number two, we will worship only for Allah. Worships can be physical worships like salah, offering salah, fasting, remembrance or zikr, recitation of Quran, migration or hijrat, jihad, and then performing hajj has a component of physical worship as well. And then worships are monetary worships, like paying the zakat and paying charity in the way of Allah, and then, then spending for jihad. And again, I repeat, 
Hajj has a monetary as well as a physical component of worship. And then spiritual worships like the fear of Allah, piety, taqwa, then remembrance, remembrance of Allah or zikr, gratitude to Allah, that is shukr, and then dependence on Allah, reliance and dependence or trust on Allah, that is tawakkul. These are all spiritual worships. Now, all these forms of worships will only be for Allah and of Allah. That is exactly what Allah orders in Surah Fusilat, verse number 37, where Allah says, لا تسجدوا للشمس ولا القمر واسجدوا لله الذي خلق حنا إن كنتم مياه تعبدون Do not prostrate to the sun or to the moon, but prostrate to Allah who has created them. And if it is Him you wish to serve. So, worshipping for Allah, the Salah will be for Allah. As Allah says in Surah Hajj, verse number 77, O believers, you bow down, you prostrate, and you worship your sustainer, and you do good deeds so that you may be their successors. So all the salah, all the fasting, all the performing of hajj and spending of zakat and spending of all forms of charity will be in the path of Allah and for Allah. Dedication, ablation, vowing, offering sacrifices should be all for Allah. Supplication, lahu da'batul haqq. Supplication, seeking protection, a'udhu billah. Repentance, Rabbi khfir warham wa anta khayru rahimeen. Trust, reliance, hasbi Allah la ilaha illahu. Hasbun Allah ni'mal mawla wa ni'mal wakil. This is all the oneness of the worships of Allah. And then in the oneness of worship, after all these forms of worship, the obedience of Allah. Obedience will only be of Allah. Submission, surrendering will be for Allah. What does that mean? What does that exactly means is that we realize and we announce that if the desires of our soul, the desires of our soul the orders are the wishes of our family, our spouse, our children. The traditions are the customs of our society and of our community or the laws, the regulations of our country. They, they, are, they abide by the orders of Quran and Hadith. They abide by the orders of are the commandments of Quran and Sunnah, then we will abide by them. We will obey them. We will accept them. But if in any form, all of the explained above, which I've explained, they clash, they negate, they oppose, or they are contrary to the orders of, or the commandments of Quran or Sunnah or Hadith, then we will not abide obey or accept them. This is the worship or the obedience of Allah only. As Allah says in Surah Furqan, verse number 43, Have you ever seen a person? Have you ever seen a person who has taken as his own desires he has taken his own desires as his God, as his Allah. What does that mean? That means that we are supposed to obey Allah. But when what our heart starts desiring for, we start obeying that and leave the commandments and the orders of Allah. This is making our souls 
This is making our our own self as what? Our desires as an ilah. And then the second thing of oneness of worship is that the worships, all the worships would only be for Allah. They will be only for Allah. The purpose of any of the physical or the monetary or the spiritual worships would not, would not be in any form other to please Allah, to save ourselves from his punishment, to save ourselves from his hellfire, to save her, ourselves from his wrath. The purpose of all our bodily or our verbal worships will we neither be to please or to impress people around us, nor would it be to gain the worldly repetitions, the fame, the popularity, or the worldly successes or gains. The purpose would be just to seek Allah's pleasure. No worldly gains or interest whatsoever. Prophet ﷺ was heard asking and telling the companions that shouldn't I inform you of an evil deed which is even more immense and gross and intense than the faction of the Jal or the Antichrist? They said, please do so. The Prophet ﷺ said, concealed polytheism. And then he was asked that what does it mean? Prophet ﷺ said that if a person stands up and starts praying and he notices that somebody is looking at him and then in this condition he just prolongs his salah, like prolonging the the raku, the prolonging the prostration of the sajda or the qiyam, just because he wants to impress the person, this is concealed polytheism. This salah will not be for, a light will be for impressing the person. The third form of the faith is the third aspect of the faith in oneness of Allah is the oneness in the attributes of Allah. The attributes of Allah are so countless and there are so many that it is just not possible to enumerate them or even to imagine them as Allah declares in Surah Al-Kahf. Verse number 109. Say that if the oceans were ink to write the words of my Lord, sooner would the oceans be exhausted than the words of my Allah. Even, even if similar another ocean was added for the purpose. So this is how we can understand that the countless attributes of Allah are countless and innumerable. So anybody associating the attributes of Allah to someone else is then committing polytheism in the attributes of Allah and it will be a major revealed polytheism like one of the attributes of Allah is that he is Rabbul Alameen the sustainer of the worlds he is the provider Razik Razak he knows the future Alimul Ghaib Allamul Ghayub he is the creator Khalik Khalak he is the helper. So now you see if any person rather than praying to Allah and rather than if the person is needing any forms of sustenance or any form of provisions then rather than asking for the razak Allah is Razik, Allah is Razak and he has the keys for the provision 
Allah says, يَرْزُقُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ بِغَيْرِ حِسَاب But knowing everything like this, a person still supplicates or calls to anybody other than Allah. May it be a saint, may it be a prophet. Then this will be polytheism. Like here in the subcontinent, for people in the subcontinent, they they start asking Sayyid Ali Hijwari, Rahmatullah Alay, as Ya Data, O Provider, Ya Ganjabash, O Provider of the Triers. So this is polytheism. Allah knows the future. He is Alimul Ghaib, Allah Mul Ghayub. But if any person, I'll be talking about the whole uh, concept of future predictions in the lecture after the whole topic of polytheism, inshallah. If somebody goes to a paramist or to an astrologist to find about the future, this again will be what? This will be polytheism. And this will be major revealed polytheism. Allah is the helper. But like in subcontinent, people start causing some saint as Ghosi Azam, Ghosi Thakalain, the greatest helper. This is negation of the concept of monotheism in the attributes of Allah. And this is an unpardonable sin. This is an unpardonable sin. So we nearly have talked about the main concepts. Now, I would want all of us to understand the different types of polytheism. Polytheism can be major or minor. It can be concealed or it can be revealed. Then it can be in the being, in the worships, or in the attributes of Allah. Polytheism and monotheism are two conditions which are totally opposite. They're antagonistic. And they can both never coexist. If a person is indulging in polytheism, then he is obviously and very obviously negating the concepts of monotheism or the belief and faith in oneness of Allah. And a person who has a strong heartfelt conviction of faith and belief in the oneness of Allah will obviously be negating and refraining from polytheism. Allah, help us all protect and elevate our faith and belief. Allah, Allah, protect, protect the faith, the belief, of our families, of our descendants. Allah, we all pray to you. May death be attended to all of us when we are in a state of faith. We, we are in a state of perfection of belief. We are in a state of obedience. May death be attended to us when we are in a condition of remembrance, of gratitude, when we are, we are performing salah, when we are in a position of prostration, Allah may be, may we be the lucky ones to be uttering la ilaha illallah at the time of death. Allah may we be the lucky ones to, to spend our lives till death, to strive, to struggle till our last breath, to spend our lives according to the concept of La ilaha illallah. Allah save us all from polytheism and help us all be steadfast on all forms and aspects of monotheism. Verse 25 And among them are those who listen to you but we have placed over their hearts coverings, lest they understand it, and in their ears deafness, and if they should see every sign, they will not believe in it, 
even when they come to you arguing with you, those who disbelieve, they say, this is not but legends of the former people. And they prevent others from him and are themselves remote from him. And they do not destroy except themselves, but they perceive it not. From here, now verses number 23, uh, 27 to 23, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be talking about the belief, after talking about the belief on the oneness of Allah, now in these verses, Allah will be mentioning about the hereafter and the day of judgment. If you could but see when they are made to stand before the fire and they will say, Oh, what, oh, would that we could be returned to the life on earth and do not deny the signs of our Lord and be among the believers. But what they concealed before has now appeared to them. And even if they were returned, they would return to that which they were forbidden. And indeed, they are liars. And so uh, in lifetime, they used to believe and they used to say what? They say there is none but our worldly life and we will not be reassured. So now what will happen to them and what their condition on the day of judgment will be? If you could but see when they will be made to stand before their Lord, he will say, is this not the truth? They will say, yes, by our Lord. He will then say, so taste the punishment because you used to disbelieve. Disbelieve in what? In the oneness of Allah and in the day of judgment. Those will have laws to deny the meeting with Allah until when the hour of resurrection comes upon them unexpectedly, they will say, Oh, how great is our regret over what we neglected concerning it while they bear their bud burdens on their backs. Unquestionably, evil is that which they bear. And the worldly life is not but amusement and diversion, but the home of hereafter is best for those who fear Allah. So will you not reason? We know that you are saddened by what they say, and indeed they do not call you untruthful, but it is the verses of Allah that the wrongdoers are rejecting. And certainly were messengers denied before you, but they were patient over the effects of denial, and they were harmed until our victory came to them. And none can alter the words of Allah, and there has certainly come to you some information about the previous messengers. So what we realize is that in all these verses, Allah has at first uh, invited all the reciters of the verses towards belief in oneness of Allah and has negated all forms of polytheism. And then there has been a mention of uh, the belief on hereafter. And so continuously also along with all these has been continuously a narration of belief in the prophethood of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah in these verses is mentioning the invitation towards belief in the prophethood of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And at the same time, the verses have been negating and refuting in answering all the objections, the accusations, and the allegations by the opponents. So I would want to stop here, and I will also want to talk about the concept of belief in the prophethood of all the prophets and the messengers sent down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now repeating again, we all should know and believe that for salvation on the day of judgment, Two things are mandatory. Number one is perfection of faith and belief. And the second is obviously having righteous deeds which have been done in this worldly life. Now, faith and belief is regarding five aspects as has been explained repeatedly in Quran. Iman billah, Iman bil akhirah, Iman bil malaika, Iman bil qutub, and Iman bil rusul. That is having faith and believe in Allah, having faith and believe in the day of judgment and having faith and believe in the angels, in the divine scriptures and in the messengers and prophets of Allah. 
as has been reported in a tradition by Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Buni al-Islam ala khamsin, shahadatan an la ilaha illallah, wa muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu, iqam salata wa ita is zakata wa hajji wa sawmi ramazan. That there are four, five pillars of Islam are what? that we witness that there is no deity but Allah and Prophet Sallallahu is a servant and a messenger of Allah to establish the Salah and to pay the obligatory Zakah and to make pilgrimage and to do what? And to fast in the month of Ramazan. So that is what we, we learn from here and also from all these verses is that believe in prophets and believe in the divine scriptures is mandatory and it needs we need to believe in the prophets and the books revealed to them and the revelation sent to them to perfect and to complete our faith the first thing which i would want to talk about is that why did allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send his messengers and why did allah choose people for prophethood we know that allah says in quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided the mankind for towards both the roots because this period, this stay in the life of this world is what? It is a period of trial. As Allah says, He has sent down giving us life and then takes us back after the death. And this interim period is a period of trial where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to check who does what? Ahsanu amala. So that who, if the person does Ahsanu amala, will be rewarded with the bounties and the blessings of Jannah and those who fail to strive for Ahsanu Amala, they will be given as the punishment of hellfire. But not only is this a period of trial, Allah has done what? Allah has hadainahun najadain. Allah has shown the both paths, the path which will roll down towards the hellfire, the pit of the hellfire and the steep and the steep climb uphill to the destination of Jannah. Both these paths have been repeatedly explained and highlighted and narrated in the verses of Quran. And to show the path, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose prophets. And it is to guide the mankind and to show the both paths, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose prophets and sent revelations and sent holy books to guide the people towards both these paths. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made these prophets as human models of all the revelations and all the divine scriptures. And it is like the purpose of sending down the messengers and the prophets i'll be able to like explain you with a brief example now imagine that if you have to reach to a destination and you don't know the place and you don't know the route to go to the destination what would you do you would obviously ask people who know the route and you come across a person when you ask that i have to reach such and such place and the person just explains verbally the person just tells you orally that you have to follow the route and you have to go to the um, such and such road uh, road and then you turn towards the right and then you at the, uh, the next point you turn left and the person just verbally or orally explains you the whole route now you next you next relate to another person who tells you the whole thing verbally but then he the person makes a map a road map and a guide map for you and hands it over to you for your reaching to the destination and then there is a third person the third person does what explains verbally and then makes a road map and a guide map hands it over to you and in the end the person says that okay fine i st i think that you're still like confused and you still won't be able to get to your destination so what i should do is that i drive in front of you and you come behind me i move in front of you when you you come after me and i will guide you to that place who would you relate to obviously this third person so this is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Rahman and Rahim Rabb has done for all of us. He has explained the verses of Quran and that is the verbal, that is the oral revelations of Quran which have been sent to us. And then the road map, the guide 
map to Jannah is the Quran itself. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam as a human guide. And Allah has instructed all of us in Quran saying, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رُسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ That for sure is in the manners of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the model of excellence for all of you. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has repeated so many times in Quran, Atiullah wa Atiur Rasul. Because guidance of Allah is the verbal guidance of Allah is through the Quran, is through the revolutions which were sent down to the prophets. The roadmap to Jannah is by the manual of Quran. And the human model is what is the model of excellence of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that is why prophets were sent to all mankind in all the different ages and they were revealed, they were given revelations by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guiding all mankind and all the bondsmen. Now belief in, uh, belief in prophets and belief in the holy books is therefore mandatory for completion and perfection of the faith. How do we have to believe in the prophets is the first thing is what we learn from the verses of Surah Baqarah. Allah says in verse 4 of Surah Baqarah, that we believe in what was revealed to Prophet and what was revealed to, to the prophets before him. And how do we do that? We believe in all the prophets and we believe in all the messengers and we believe in all the revelations and the divine scriptures sent to all of them. And how do we do that? Allah mentions in Surah Baqarah, verse number 126, and Surah Al Imran, verse number 84. That we do not differentiate, do, we do not differentiate among all the prophets and messengers, and we are all Muslims. So we, to be Muslims, we need to believe in all the prophets and all the revelations and holy books sent towards all of them. This means what? That we will, we will be believing all the prophets and all the messengers of Allah, that they were chosen people of Allah, and he had chosen them for sending them revelations. But we will be, be believing in the prophethood of all. We will be, we will be uh, showing our respect and regard and love for all the prophets and messengers also but we will only we will only follow and obey the teachings and the messages and the hadith and the sunnah of prophet sallam because it is only his teachings his sunnah his hadith which is perfect which is final and which is also protected so that is what we mean by uh, that we will believe in all, we will love all, we will respect all, and we will regard all. But as far as obedience and following will be only and only regarding the sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu which has been perfected and it has been protected also. So the second point we need to relate regarding the belief on the prophets is that we need to believe that they were humans, as has been mentioned in Surah Kahf, verse number 110, and Surah Fusilat, verse number 6, that the verses say, Qul innama ana basharum mislukum, innama yuha ilayya, innama ilahukum ilahu wahid. The verse clearly highlights that even Prophet Sallallahu has been asked to announce and tell the people that he was what? Innama ana basharum mislukum, that he was a human being like the rest of the human beings. And this has also to be believed. And this is an article of faith regarding the faith in the prophethood of prophets. What does this mean? And what does this imply is that we need to believe that prophets were physically, emotionally, socially, psychologically, they were humans. Like in all their body structures, their skin, their muscle, their joints, their organs, their eyes, their ears were very much human. Moreover, their physical needs, they, they felt like 
they they got tired they were hungry they were thirsty they had to sleep they had to take rest they had pain they had fever they were injured their bodies ached and then emotionally they they used to get upset they did they were happy they were sad they were anxious they would cry they would laugh and then socially also they needed and they had they had and they needed relationships they they had parents they had siblings they they had wives they had children and they had friends they had enemies so they were physically they were emotionally they were psychologically they were socially they were very much humans the difference the difference as this verse is these two verses explain the difference is that they were chosen by allah subhanahu wa taala then they were chosen for prophethood and then they were given revelations so it was this sending down of revelations by allah subhanahu wa taala which made the difference and made them superior to the rest of the bondsmen and it is because of these revelations that they needed to be it was needed that the bondsmen and the people they needed to obey them they needed to follow them and they needed to copy them so this is another concept which has to be added in the belief of the prophethood of prophets and the third thing is that uh, moreover i would also want to explain that why is it important that uh, prophets should be considered as humans physically emotionally and psychologically why is it important that they should be considered humans is number one is so that the bondsmen they prevent considering the prophets as elah themselves that raising raising the level of the prophethood or the prophets to the ranks of allah will be prevented as the christians they said wa qalat an nasara isa ibn allah wa qalat al yahud uzair ibn allah they considering they considering their prophets as superhumans not as humans considering their prophets above the level of humans they raise the level and the stature and the grades of their prophets to what to the level of allah themselves so to prevent the people from raising the level of the prophets to the level of allah themselves it has been clearly highlighted that they need to believe that the prophets were what they were human moreover there was another reason because you know that considering them as humans will have another effect because we know that prophets they acted upon all the commandments of allah the prophets they obeyed and they followed all the messages and orders and do's and don'ts and commandments of allah so they acted upon all the orders and thus they became a role model now if they are not considered as human and they and the people they start considering them as supermen or consider them as supernatural or superhumans they would easily say that the prophets being superhumans they could obey all the commandments of allah and since we are humans it is not humanly possible for us to obey all the commandments of allah and they so if they are taken as human and they are they acted upon all the model all the commandments of allah then their model of excellence their model of excellence we will not be able to escape and we will not be able to get away and we will not be able to find any justification realizing that they were humans very much like the way we are humans and if they acted upon all the commandments of allah we being similar humans we can also act upon all the orders of allah so they being very much humans if they could act it act upon them we can also being their followers accept all the orders of allah so that is why it is needed to consider them as humans when we have faith or belief in the in the prophets in the prophethood of prophets and the third thing which we need to believe when we believe in the prophethood is is the concept of the seal of prophets as has been said allah has said in uh, his mention in surah ahzab ma kana muhammadun aba ahadin mir rijalikum walakin rasulullah wa khatam an nabiyyina wa kana allah bi kulli shay'in alima it is not that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not the father of any one of you 
your men, but he is the messenger of Allah and he is the seal of all prophets. And Allah indeed is knowing and of everything. So here we learn that one of the concepts of belief in prophethood is to realize that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the seal of prophets. Similarly, uh, it has been reported in a tradition that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, La nabi wa la There will be no prophet after me and there will be no follower after you also. So he is what? He is Khatimun Nabiheen. He is Khatimul Mursaleen. There will be no Nabi after him and there will be no Rasul after him. There will be no revelation after Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in Surah Al-Maidah. The deen and Islam and the messages of Quran and Islam, they have been perfected. They have been completed regarding their quality and quantity. And there will be no revelation after the death of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now... There will be no prophet, there will be no divine scripture, there will be no book, and there will be no revelation. So what are the implications of believing in this concept of seal of prophethood is, the first is that anyone who does not believe in this concept of seal of prophethood, then his faith of prophethood will not be complete. Any person who claims that he has been sent with prophethood and he is sent with revolution or those who believe in the prophethood are in the being the messenger of anybody else after prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then the belief of prophethood will not be perfected and such a person who does not believe in the concept of seal of prophethood or khatimun nabiyyin prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then the person will not be a muslim the person will not be a believer and the second thing is, we need to remember that since there's going to be no messenger of Allah, since there's going to be no prophet, since there are going to be no more revelations and divine scriptures, then who is going to pass on the messages of Allah, the teachings of Quran and Hadith to the bondsmen, to all the people in the world is who? is us, we the followers of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We need to spread the teachings of Quran and Hadith till where? Till Ya Ayyuhannas. Because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in Quran does not just address the obedient. Allah does not just address and order the servants of Allah, but the call of the Quran is guided towards Ya Ayyuhannas. So this is our duty. So this is realizing that there is the seal of prophets and no prophet is going to come and perform this duty. So this is our duty to spread to all the people of the world. This is an immense task which has to be accomplished by the followers of Prophet Sallallahu and by all of us. Little do we realize. Let's ask all of ourselves, do we ever realize? Do we ever think? Do we ever bother? Do we ever concentrate the callosity of our duty as a Muslim or as a believer? And you know, to, to realize the state of affairs regarding the propagation and spreading and preaching of the messages of Quran and Hadith, if we just look around ourselves and we statistically try to analyze the state of affairs regarding the information of the people regarding the messages of Quran and Hadith, just, just think and just try to statistically analyze how many people around us, they recite the Quran. How many people around us, they read the Hadith. How many people around us are reading and understanding the meaning of Quran and what percentage has gone through the messages of complete Quran very pathetically and very, very pathetically would we all realize that not even the 2%, not even 2% of the literate, educated class of the Muslims of today, they have been through the message, the complete translation of Quran. Do we realize the callosity of the job 
which is left behind to be completed by all of us? Do we know? Do we do we know what period is left for us to complete this immense task? Life is uncertain, and the task is such immense. What are we doing? Where are we spending our time, our money, our, our capabilities? We have all the time in the world to go about window shopping. And you know, there are people I see, they have time to get bored. Getting bored, having the time to get bored, suffering from boredom, really? With so much of task to be accomplished, with so much of work to be done, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us, help us all realize this responsibility which we have as being the followers of Prophet Sallallahu and believing that he was the Khatimun Nabiyyin and there's going to be no prophet spreading the words of Allah to the bondsmen. Help us, help us set bigger, bigger targets in our life. And help us set this as a target and make this as a goal of our life and guide us and help us and support us and protect us to strive and struggle for this cause. So Allah says, and certainly were messengers denied before you, but they were patient over the effects of denial and they were harmed and they were harmed until our victory came to them and none can alter the words of Allah. And there has certainly come to you some information about the previous messengers. And if their evasion is difficult for you, then if you are able to seek a tunnel into the earth or a stairway into the sky to bring them a sign, then do so. But if Allah has willed, he would have united them upon guidance. So never be after ignorant. A'uzu billahi an akuna min al Only those who hear will respond, but the dead, Allah will resurrect them. Then to him, they will be returned. And they say, why has a sign not been sent down to him from his Lord? Say, indeed, Allah is able to send down a sign, but most of them do not know. And there is no creature on whom, uh, there is no creature or, or within the earth or the bird that flies with its wings, except that they are communities like you. We have not neglected in a register a thing, then unto their Lord they will be gathered. But those who deny our verses are deaf and dumb within darkness. Whomever Allah wills, he leaves astray. And whomever he wills, he puts him on a straight path. Allahumma ikhtina sirwat al-mustaqeem. Allahumma alhimna rushdan wa aizna min shururi anfusina. Allahumma rahmatika arju fala takilni ila nafsi min tarfata aynin wa aslihni shak. Say, have you considered if there came to you the punishment of Allah or there came to you the hour, is it other than Allah you would invoke if you should be truthful? No, it is him alone you would invoke and he would remove that for which you invoked him if he willed and you would forget what you associated with him. Rabbana, la to ze hulubana, bada is hadaitana, wahablana, miladun karahma, inaka antal wahab, Subhanakallahuma behamdika, Nashaduan la ilaha illa anta nastakiruka, vanatu bo lake, Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Aisa, the Amaya Sipun, was salamun alal mursilin, while hamdulillah, he rabbil alamin, amin sumamin.